Part 4 Ripples Chapter 1 October 19th, Friday A phone call from the manager's office woke Asakawa from his slumber. The manager was reminding them that their checkout was at 11 a.m. and asking if they'd prefer to stay another night. Asakawa reached out with his free hand and picked up his watch beside his pillow. His arms were tired, just lifting them was an effort. They didn't hurt yet, but they'd probably ache like hell tomorrow. He wasn't wearing his glasses, so he couldn't read the time until he brought the watch right up to his eyes. A few minutes past eleven. Asakawa couldn't think of how to reply right away. He didn't even know where he was. Will you be staying another night? Asked the manager, trying to suppress his annoyance. Ryuji groaned right beside him. This wasn't his own room, that was for sure. It was as if the whole world had been repainted without his knowing it. The thick line connecting past to present and present to future had been cut into two, before his sleep and after it. Hello? Now the manager was worried that there was nobody on the other end of the line. Without even knowing why, Asakawa felt joy flood his breast. Ryuji rolled over and opened his eyes slightly. He was drooling. Asakawa's memories were hazy. All he found when he searched his recollections was darkness. He could more or less remember visiting Dr. Nagao and then heading for Villa Lock Cabin, but everything after that was vague. Dark scenes came to him, one after another, and his breath caught in his throat. He felt like he did after waking up from a powerful dream, one that left a strong impression even though he'd forgotten what it was about. But for some reason, his spirits were high. Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Asakawa finally managed to reply, adjusting his grip on the receiver. Checkout time is 11 o'clock. Got it. We'll get our things together and leave right away. Asakawa adopted an officious tone to match the manager's. He could hear a faint trickle of water from the kitchen. It seemed someone hadn't turned the faucet tight last night before going to sleep. Asakawa hung up the phone. Ryuji had closed his eyes again. Asakawa shook him. Hey, Ryuji, get up. He had no idea how long they'd slept. Ordinarily, Asakawa slept no more than five or six hours a night, but now he felt like he'd been asleep for much longer than that. It had been a long time since he'd been able to sleep soundly, untroubled. Hey, Ryuji, if we don't get out of here, they're going to charge us for another night. Asakawa shook Ryuji harder, but he didn't wake up. Asakawa raised his eyes and saw the milky white plastic bag on the dining room table. Suddenly, as if some chance happening had brought back a fragment of the dream, he remembered what was inside it. Calling Sadako's name. Pulling her out of the cold earth under the floor. Stuffing her into a plastic bag. The sound of running water. It had been Ryuji, last night, who had gone to the sink and washed the mud from Sadako. The water was still running. By then, the appointed time had already passed. And even now, Asakawa was still alive. He was overjoyed. Death had been breathing down his neck, and now that it had been cleared away, life seemed more concentrated. It began to glow. Sadako's skull was beautiful, like a marble sculpture. Hey, Ryuji, wake up! Suddenly, he got a bad feeling. Something caught in a corner of his mind. He put his ear into Ryuji's chest. He wanted to hear Ryuji's heart beating through his thick sweatshirt, to know he was still alive. But just as his ear was about to touch Ryuji's chest, Asakawa suddenly found himself in a headlock held by two powerful hands. Asakawa panicked and started to struggle. Gotcha. Thought I was dead, didn't you? Ryuji released his grip on Asakawa's head and laughed an odd, childlike laugh. How could he joke around after what they'd just been through? Anything was liable to happen. 
If at that instant he'd seen Sadako Yamamoto alive and standing by the table, and Ryuji tearing at his hair dying, Asakawa would have believed his eyes. He suppressed his anger. He owned Ryuji a great deal. Stop fooling around. It's payback time. You scared the bejesus out of me last night. Still on his side, Ryuji began to chuckle. What did I do? You collapsed down there at the bottom of the well. I really thought you'd gone and died. I was worried. Time was up. I thought you were out of the game. Asakawa said nothing, just blinked several times. Huh. You probably don't even remember. Ungrateful bastard. Now that he thought about it, Asakawa couldn't remember crawling out of the well on his own. Finally, he recalled dangling from the rope, his strength totally spent. Hauling his 60-kilogram frame four or five meters straight up couldn't have been easy, even for someone of Ryuji's strength. The image of himself hanging suspended reminded him somehow of the stone statue of Enno Ozunu being pulled up from the bottom of the sea. Shizuko had gained mysterious powers for fishing out the statue, but all Ryuji had to show for his troubles were aches and pains. Ryuji, asked Asakawa in a strangely altered voice. What? Thanks for everything you've done. I really owe you. Don't start getting mushy on me. If it hadn't been for you, I'd be... Well, you know. Anyway, thanks. Cut the crap. You're gonna make me puke. Gratitude isn't worth a single yen. Well, then, how about some lunch? I'm buying. Oh, well, in that case... Ryuji pulled himself to his feet, staggering a little. All of his muscles were stiff. Even Ryuji was having trouble making his body do what he wanted it to. From the South Hakone Pacific Land Rest House, Asakawa called his wife in Ashikaga and told her he'd pick her up in a rental car Sunday morning, as promised. So, everything's all taken care of? she asked. All Asakawa could say was, probably, from the fact that he was still here, alive, he could only guess that things were resolved. But as he hung up the phone, something still bothered him deeply. He couldn't quite get over it. Just from the mere fact that he was alive, he wanted to believe that everything was wrapped up neatly, but... Thinking that Ryuji might have the same doubts, Asakawa walked back to the table and asked, This is really the end, right? Ryuji had wolfed down his lunch while Asakawa was on the phone. Your family doing all right? Ryuji wasn't going to answer Asakawa's question right away. Yeah. Hey, Ryuji, are you feeling like it's not all over yet? You worried? Aren't you? Maybe. About what? What bothers you? What the old woman said. Next year, you're going to have a child. That prediction of hers. The moment he realized Ryuji had exactly the same doubts, Asakawa turned to trying to dispel those doubts. Maybe the you, just that once, was referring to Shizuko instead of Sadako. Ryuji rejected this straight away. Not possible. The images on that video came from Sadako's own eyes and mind. The old woman was talking to her. You can only refer to Sadako. Maybe her prediction was false. Sadako's ability to foresee the future should have been infallible. 100%. But Sadako was physically incapable of bearing children. That's why it's so strange. Biologically, Sadako was a man, not a woman, so there was no way she could have a kid. Plus, she was a virgin until right before she died. And... And... Her first sexual experience was Nagao, the last smallpox victim in Japan. Quite a coincidence. It was said that in the distant past, God and the devil, cells and viruses, male and female, even light and darkness had been identical, with no internal contradiction. Asakawa began to feel uneasy. Once the discussion moved into the realm of genetic structures, or the cosmos before the creation of the Earth, 
the answers were beyond the pale of individual questioning. All he could do at this point was to persuade himself to dispel the niggling uncertainties in his heart and tell himself that it was all over. But I'm alive. The riddle of the erased charm is solved. This case is closed. Then Asakawa realized something. Hadn't the statue of Enno Ozinu willed itself to be pulled up from the bottom of the ocean? That will had worked on Shizuko, guiding her actions, and as a result she was given her new power. Suddenly that pattern looked awfully familiar. Bringing Sadako's bones up from the bottom of the well. Fishing Enno Ozinu's statue up from the ocean floor. But what bothered him was the irony. The power Shizuko was given brought her only misery. But that was looking at things the wrong way. Maybe in Asakawa's case, simply being released from the curse was the equivalent of Shizuko's receiving power. Asakawa decided to make himself think so. Ryuji glanced at Asakawa's face, reassuring himself that the man before him was, indeed, alive, then nodded twice. I suppose you do have a point. Exhaling slowly, he sank back into his chair. And yet... What? Ryuji sat straight up and asked, as if to himself, What did Sadako give birth to?